Hi, Mark Reedman, Arts Upper Hunter here, and today I'm in conversation with Katrina Cat Grabham, who is a local composer and musician. Welcome, Katrina. Thank you, Mark. Where did your musical journey begin? Um, like a lot of musicians, I uh, started learning music in school, um, or while I was at school, learning piano. And um, even um, starting to create my own little musical soundscapes uh, at at a fairly young age, maybe um, by 12, 11 or 12, I was starting to um, play around with the music I was learning. And then by the time I hit um, maybe mid-high school, I had um, a music teacher who encouraged me to start writing down my own music and um, just really enjoyed the process and uh, at some point, point during my late high school decided that it's something that I wanted to study. And what happened to those pieces you were writing? Did you perform them? Did anything sort of go further with them? Those ones from high school? Yeah. Oh, they would have, most of them were written for piano, which is my instrument. So I, um, I would have just played them myself or I might have written something for um, one of the one of my classmates that might have played, say, saxophone or something like that. So um, I just worked with what I had on a. It was just on a very small scale, and it really wasn't until I hit university that I started to stretch. Of course, it makes sense. And so you went on to study music. Whereabouts? Um, University of Newcastle. Yep. At, at the conservatorium there. Yep, the lovely big conservatorium there. And yes. Which I know quite well. Yes. Which I think now is the um, School of Creative Industries down there. I, it could be. <laughs> you might be more up with where it's at than me. So were you living in Newcastle? No, I actually um, grew up in Armidale. And then to study, I moved to Newcastle. Um, hmm. And what sort of a degree did you do? I started out with um, a Bachelor of Music, majoring in composition, and ended up being invited to do honours there, and then being invited to, or encouraged to start a master's, and that ended up sort of expanding with the amount of work that I was putting into it. And so we turned that into a PhD, which, yeah, took longer. <laughs> uh, added on an extra um, one to two years. Yeah. So it was all full time. And we might come to the PhD, but I'm interested in um, you talking a little bit about what you actually study doing composition do you, what, what do you do? What do you study? Yeah, okay. So um, like a Bachelor of Music degree has got a lot of core subjects that everyone will take that um, is regardless of what your major is, whether you're learning, whether you're majoring in clarinet or voice or composition. Um, and that does take up a fair um, amount of the degree and then you've got um, and that's things like learning traditional and that well this is when I was there and I do believe that things change and evolve but um, you know traditional harmony learning how to write um, write um, harmonic chord progressions and things in the technically correct way um, musicology studying composers and all of that sort of thing. And then um, as a composition student, um, I would have to, I would have to submit um, a reasonably, a reasonably sized work that would have grown each year in size and scope, um, each, and that was submitted at the end of each semester. 
And that was something that I worked on with my composition teacher every week. So we would have like a one-to-one lesson in the same style that um, a pianist might go in and have their one-to-one lesson with a piano teacher. Uh, and then we would also have um, have like more of an academic class where all of the composition students would come together and we would um, study different compositional techniques from, you know, the last 300 years perhaps. Yep. And then we would also um, – we also had another subject that was um, more contemporary-based um, where we would share maybe more of our own findings around different composers and ensembles and – Things like that. So did you have, at that stage, a particular composer that you liked more than Oh, um, actually, like, university was great for me in terms of expanding my awareness of different composers. And I would go and lock myself in the... <laughs> there was a little, um, like, sound room in the music library and I would just... Um, pop the headphones on and go from like either vinyl to vinyl, listening to really old recordings or um, CDs. Um, I did, there were multiple composers that that I remember I really enjoyed studying. Probably um, most of them were from um, like the late 1800s uh, through to like 20th century composers, early 20th century composers, mid 20th century composers. Um, and then as my degree, it, it, it just, it varied. Yeah. And that led on to your PhD? Uh, yes, all of those studies ended up turning into that, yes. <laughs> Who I note your supervisor was Andrew Ford, whose name rang a bell, but I couldn't, um, nail him down. So I googled and he has the ABC music show every Saturday. Yes, yes, so um, which is a great show um, and he is an amazing source of knowledge and he was really a great um, teacher to study under. And can you talk a bit about your PhD, what you were, what you were doing and, uh, and I was curious when a composer does a PhD do you write a PhD or do you compose a people? How does that work? Yeah, and you know, it's. Um, I think a PhD is is different. Well, it's, it's going to be widely different for each person that would undertake it. And um, the idea is is that you're creating something new to to put out there into the world and for me it was a portfolio of compositions and but I did have to submit um, a, a thesis of writing where I um, went through the process of composing and it was actually called A Composer's Journey um, and talked about the influences and the process of writing it. Um, and I should also note that while, like, Andrew Ford was my my supervisor for the compositional content, I also had, um, a, like, a co-supervisor uh, who looked after the writing part of it, uh, Michael Ewens, who is from Newcastle University, uh, um, a professor there. And you were doing that? Full time for two years. Uh, would have been three years, mm. I'd say. And yeah. if you don't mind me asking, how did you survive? How did you pay the rent? Um, I was actually lucky enough to land a scholarship oh. while, <laughs> while I, yeah, which um, really was very influential on me deciding to undertake it. Mm, I imagine it would have yeah. helped. Yeah, yeah, and then and so I also taught piano as well just to help <laughs> so before we go on to um, some of the work that you've um, composed I'm curious as a not very good musician 
about the mechanics of composing for a group of musicians or even a full orchestra. How, what are the mechanics of doing that? Do you write a part for the percussion, then a different part for the oboe, or, and do they each get a different bit of music? How does that sort of work? Yeah, um, it would be different for every composer, I think. They would have a different process of composing. For me, um, when I start composing, I usually um, will compose at the piano with a sheet of manuscript in front of me and a pencil, and I just will jot down little um, musical ideas and slowly start to piece it together and it might not even look like um, a piece for full orchestra it might just be treble instrument like bass instrument and that might have like a harmonic structure penciled in and just very slowly it expands until it looks more like um, a full score which would have all of the instruments or most of the instruments written in there and um as far as um, players getting their own parts, it's not until all of it's not until the piece is complete, and I would put it into a a music publishing software, so like Finale or um, Sibelius, okay. and um, then once the full score is complete, then I'd pull out each part individually and um, print it out, and there's there's the percussion part or there's the clarinet part. So how does that work? You, is it like uh, you press print or how do you, what do you put into the, the program? Um, to... from, from the dots that you've written. Right, okay. So you, you've got dots on your page that you've yep. written. Yep, and then uh, it, it is a process like to learn to use like any new software. Yeah. Um, I actually have, uh, most composers would probably have a keyboard um, that's hooked via MIDI to uh -huh. to their computer, and then yeah, they would yeah. um, enter it all in via MIDI. Okay. And where does your inspiration come from? Probably different things Everywhere. at different times. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, look, it's varied greatly over the years. At the moment, I get a lot of my inspiration from different like uh, I have a huge range of music that I like to expose myself to I have a really strong interest in world music in um, African music African drumming um, in um, Eastern music in the um, I've been exploring the um, like the Hindu tradition of sacred like Sanskrit chants um, and all of the music that that sort of is in that container um, and then I still have classical music composers that I draw from I can be inspired by I can very often be inspired by text and I'm an avid reader, hmm. uh, so whether it's poetry or I might just find a bit of text that is either inspiration for a piece or um, it becomes part of the piece. And let's say you've got some text that moves you. Um, do you hear the whole, perhaps, piece that you are going to write in your head or do you hear um, a particular instrument or how does that sort of happen? Mm. Uh, again, that would vary, but maybe it could even be that that text brings up a certain feeling in me and I think, right, I want to convey that feeling and I'm going to do this through like, through dark through dense strings or 
something like that or this is really energetic or this feels really intense so I'm going to create a rhythm that's really intense to reflect that. So that would be, for me, it's not so much about hearing a complete um, piece but it would be that I just want to convey um, like a feeling or a mood or a colour. Hmm. Okay, would you now talk a little bit about some of the work that you've written? Um, what sort of work? Um, are there any that stand out that, um, you know, that have been very popular or controversial or...? Okay. Uh, I don't... <laughs> I don't know if I could say whether any of my music is or, or popular or controversial because mm. it's um, in such a small niche. And um, when I – this is just a little side tangent, if that's okay. Um, when I finished my PhD – because I'd been writing music and studying for such, it was probably about seven years and on stop, I was pretty burnt out by the time I finished it. And so I actually literally packed it all up into a box, put it in the cupboard and went and started a family. And so it's only really been in the last um, uh, maybe three or four years that I've let that all come back out again which has been really amazing and um, really um, exciting for me so just with going back to what you did say um, I probably missed that window to promote my work oh. after I finished my PhD and to get it out there however here I am now and um, starting to write music again and the um, local orchestra, the Upper Hunter Conservatorium of Music, have just um, recorded a piece of mine. And how was that received? Well, it hasn't been <laughs> put out into the public yet because we're still um, working on the recording. But um, as far as by the um, orchestral members, I think... I think they really enjoyed the challenge of, of new music, like fresh new music. Um, my music isn't always easy. And um, even just those little challenges could make it tricky for, um, for someone to sort of take it on straight away. Which sort of brings me to my next question. How does a working composer's life happen? Do you, um, do you sit down and write simply because you've got some time on your hands or you're inspired or like an actor, do you wait for the phone to ring? Mm. Somebody, how do you, you know, make a, even a vague living as a, as a composer? Mm. That would be... That would be a good question for someone who was making a living <laughs> as a composer. Yeah. Um, I don't make a living as a composer. For, so for me, um, the composing process happens usually by inspiration but uh, I, or by collaboration or request or something will happen to kickstart the process. Mm. So the piece that just was recorded by the um, the UHCM orchestra. Uh, that was something that came out of um, discussion with the conductor uh, last year. And she ended up asking, Janelle ended up asking me to, whether I'd be interested in writing for the orchestra. And that was great because it was, gave me something to work towards. So you actually wrote the piece for the orchestra? Yes. Oh, I didn't realise that. Yeah. So how long would that have taken? Uh, it took me about maybe about three months. 
very much part time. Yeah. Three, three or four months. So I, I'm a, um, I have my own business, um, piano teaching, and I have been studying sound healing, and I, uh, and I am a, a single parent to two amazing kids. So I don't have a lot of spare time uh, on my hands. So I was grabbing little pockets of time after the kids had gone to bed to compose and got it done that way. Can you talk a little bit about the sound healing? Yes, yes, because um, the sound healing is a um, really important part of my musical journey. And I feel like for me, music is taking on a therapeutic, um, I don't, can't, I can't think of the word, like a therapeutic quality. Um, it's something that I'm aware of and I'm always thinking about. Sound, I started um, my sound healing studies at the beginning of 2019 and um, just learning about um, the way our bodies respond to sound. Like that's it in a nutshell, but it's, it's a massive field and it's actually expanding very quickly too. And with whom would you do it typically? Who would I work with for sound healing? Yeah. So um, there's a few different, um, there's a few different ways that you can go with sound healing. Um, sound healing is quite, popular um, in the like the yoga community where um, where um, it is actually a part of the yoga teaching like the yoga philosophy um, and you would have a, you would go to a sound bath where there might be a room full of people and um, someone is playing is creating this sound and you just lie there and sort of immerse yourself in it so that's and it, it's like a it will put you in a deep state of relaxation and of course when the body is in that state of relaxation a lot of healing can happen it can be really beneficial for anxiety and stress and a lot of things insomnia um so that's just one area uh sound healing has is beneficial working one with one one-to-one -one with more specific uh, things. So it is actually considered like an alternative healing modality. Uh, and then there's also um, this sort of branches across into a little bit of music therapy, which it's, it feels slightly different um, where you might use sound healing for um, people or children with disabilities yeah. or you might use sound healing in um, aged care, yeah. that sort of thing. Yeah. So is the music occurring in a session uh, live? Yes. So yes. typically what sort of instrument would you use in a... Yeah, okay. So um, in... The instruments are generally a little bit more um, Eastern based, Tibetan singing bowls, um, crystal singing bowls, if you've heard of them. I play the harp anyway, and the harp works beautifully in that setting. Um, and tuning forks, mm. um, just trying to think, drumming. Mm. Yeah. Yes, and I, <clears throat> excuse me, I read you played the harp. Can you talk a bit about playing the harp? And I believe you collaborate with another local musician here. Uh, yes, I do. Um, so um, I've gotten together with, um, with the local um, artist, Morrigan Rain, and um, we have collaborated on a few harp and piano, harp and whistle um, 
pieces, which is great. Um, harp for me, I've had a harp since I was about 18, but um, it's only really been in the last few years that I've really dove deep with the harp. And um, I have a harp teacher who's based in Sydney, who I have regular Skype lessons with. Yeah. And um, interestingly, she um, started studying harp therapy at about the same time that I started studying sound healing. So we have a really nice um, conversation about how the harp can be used in a therapeutic session. It's a yeah, therapeutic setting and um, it's, yeah, it's amazing. Uh, and I, I, forgive me for asking, but um, how do you cart a harp around? Because they're quite big. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I, I don't have a full-size orchestral harp. I have a, um, what would be considered, uh, it's a lever harp. It's, um, or some people might call it a Celtic harp or a folk harp. It's a 36 string harp. And um, it's probably about maybe a meter and a half. Oh, okay. So it's not high. huge, huge. Yeah, hmm. yeah. And so you must have a pretty nice travel case for it to keep it. I, I actually don't. <laughs> you caught me out on that one, Mark. Oh. Um, well, they're I, very expensive. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just haven't got a carry case for it yet. <laughs> do you, have you or do you write anything sort of uh, more contemporary, more poppy? Are you into kind of more commercial music? I think as the closest that I get to that is the the music that I have started to write and will I see myself doing more of um, the music to do with the harp and um, like the music that I've done with Morrigan Rain has been more accessible, definitely. Um, as far as whether I would write pop music Probably not. Um, to write pop music, you do need to be a good writer of words. And I don't, I cannot write words. So um, I usually draw like my text from, yeah, from various sources. Yeah. Um, and it, I, it doesn't seem to be what is coming out of me. And because we are Arts Upper Hunter here. I have to ask you how you came to be living in Musselbrook. Yes, so um, I moved here um, about 13, nearly 14 years ago. Oh, really? Uh, and <laughs> um, just before the birth of my first child and sort of the first, um, I don't know, five years, was very much focused on um, raising a family. Um, I was teaching piano um, and I did actually end up um, running kinder music classes, early childhood music classes in the community for hmm, maybe about eight or so years. Um, and they were both piano teaching and, um, well, kinder music especially actually, was a really good way for me to be doing something musical that I could also involve my kids in because it was, it was a setting for the early childhood music, really. So for babies, toddlers, preschoolers. And do you find living in regional New South Wales an advantage? Um, as far as writing music or? Yeah. I don't think it would, in that regard, I don't think it would really matter um, where I am. I really like being in here, being here actually. I have to say that um, the community is really nice. Um, as far as writing the music, I could probably be plonked down anywhere to write the music, but. Um, the collaboration between um, musicians and, say, um, 
the support that I've had in the last um, 12 months um, of local musicians has been really amazing and I'm really grateful for that and I don't know if I would get that in a might be harder to get in a, a bigger area. And my last question, what advice would you give to a young composer? Hmm. <laughs> mm. So I, um, I really encourage my piano students to compose and um, I get really excited when they come in um, with compositions. Mm. Um, my advice would be to write, just to keep writing in whatever form. So it might not be notes on the paper, it might be using the Garage Band app and it might be throwing in and layering um, sounds over each other. Um, as far as like the composing process, just to do it and do it and do it. But also I would encourage um, budding composers to listen and expose themselves to as much different music as possible and just to not be afraid to confine themselves into a box. But just to try lots of, to be okay to, to write whatever comes out. I wish my piano teacher had have encouraged me to, <laughs> to write. Thank you very much, Katrina. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you.